brash on screen and audacious off of it, James Woods is one of the most talented actors of the 80s, one of the main villains of the 90s, and one of the staunchest opponents of the Democratic Party in the US. James Woods grew up in Rhode Island in a military family with his father and a teacher mother. From a young age, his father read Shakespeare to James, which, according to Woods, stimulated his early intellectual development and led to a phenomenal IQ score of 184. After excelling in his exams as a teenager, Woods was awarded a full scholarship to the prestigious Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The study in the political science department was challenging. The abundance of nerds with logarithmic rulers and an almost complete absence of girls, according to James, was extremely annoying. So to change the atmosphere, Woods joined a theater club. Although he had been involved in school plays since childhood, the enthusiastic response from other students to his performance made Woods consider becoming an actor. He told his mother about this, and she said that it wasn't important to her whether he would be successful. The main thing was that he promised to give it his best. James promised. In New York, where theater life was concentrated, Woods thrived. He won prestigious awards, and once he was awarded a $500 scholarship for gifted actors. In the late 60s and early 70s, he appeared in plays such as Edward Bond's Saved and Moon Children by the famous theatrical director Alan Schneider. According to colleagues' memories, Woods already knew his worth back then. He behaved audaciously and performed sharply, expressively. However, when James decided to try his luck in movies, he was in for disappointment. If the theater didn't care much about appearance, cinema was almost entirely about good looks. Woods, in his words, was ugly, skinny, with a sharp, unpleasant voice. It's no wonder he was often turned down. For six years, he languished in TV shows, or appeared in films in minor and episodic roles. He got his first significant role in the chamber film The Visitors in 72, and his breakthrough came with The Onion Field in 79. As the actor later said, no one has gone out of their way and said, let's make Jimmy Woods a star. The Visitors was a drama by Elia Kazan about the conflict between former fellow soldiers, Vietnam War veterans. Kazan was 62 at the time, considered a classic of Hollywood, but the term classic meant little to James when he thought he was being treated unfairly. In particular, Woods was annoyed by Kazan's practice of creating traumatic situations for actors. For instance, it's known that during the filming of A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, the director sent a telegram to one of the actresses stating that her mother had died. He did this so that when she came to the set, the actress could convincingly portray grief. With James, he wasn't as cruel, but overall he acted similarly. His character was supposed to feel alienated and Kazan persuaded the other actors to ignore him during breaks in filming. When Woods realized what was going on, he bluntly told the director, You know, this is fucking bullshit. I know how to act. Kazan gave in. As for The Onion Field, it was a larger scale project telling the story of Robert Gregory Powell, who in 63 kidnapped two police officers with an accomplice, shooting one of them in an onion field. Woods had to put an effort to get into this project. His agent paid for his audition, another actor was the candidate for the lead role, but remembering his mother's advice, James put a lot into the audition and got the part. When the film was released, it was successful. There were two reasons. Powell's case was well known as it touched on the infamous Lindbergh Law, which had been the subject of Hollywood thrillers like Alpha Dog. In addition, Woods' performance was so outstanding that he received a Golden Globe nomination and a heap of praise from critics. This role laid the foundation for his future work, revealing in the character of Powell such typical traits of his subsequent heroes as sardonic humor, intelligence, frenzied energy, and explosive anger. In the 80s, Woods entered his most fruitful acting period. He starred in some of the best films by David Cronenberg, Sergio Leone, and Oliver Stone, as well as appearing in less ambitious but still significant films such as Cop, Best Seller, True Believer, and The Boost. You're making one big mistake, pal. Nowadays, books are written about Cronenberg, dissecting not only his visual style but also his philosophical concepts. However, in some cases, they might be overcomplicating things, at least regarding the Videodrome. Woods said that Cronenberg himself didn't really know how the film should end. They only had 70 pages of the script, and James came to the rescue of the director, suggesting that in the end his character, like the TV double, points a mutated hand to his head, hinting at an off-screen suicide. On the set of the film, Woods was also annoyed by the abundance of makeup simulating a hole in his abdomen, commenting that he felt like a walking slit, not an actor. Although many critics now recognize Videodrome as one of the first films in the body horror subgenre, and point out that its themes were ahead of their time, the film was not fully appreciated at the time of its release. 
Once upon a time in America was different. Italian master Sergio Leone told the story of two friends, Noodles and Max, who rose together with their companions to become significant figures in the criminal world. However, beyond the crime plot, Leone also introduced universal themes of love, loneliness, and nostalgia, accompanied by a poignant soundtrack by Ennio Morricone. The project cost $30 million. Robert De Niro was signed for the leading role, so auditions for the second lead role of Max were fiercely competitive. Woods had to fight his way in again. To get the job, he asked to rehearse with De Niro, and although Max was described in the script as a light-haired Greek, James' performance so impressed both De Niro and Leon that they decided to cast him. Filming partly took place in Europe, and in the company of De Niro, Leon, and occasionally visitor Federico Fellini, Woods felt no need to show off and was happy. He even enlivened one of the stalled scenes. So his character was supposed to yell at his girlfriend and insult her, driving her out of the room while his friends laughed. However, the laughter didn't come naturally, and De Niro complained that the scene wasn't working. That's when James decided to improvise and unexpectedly inserted. You gonna tell me I don't have a way with women? <laughs> <laughs> the line served as a trigger of sorts, causing the actor to start smirking naturally, and the scene came alive. Once Upon a Time in America was also not appreciated upon its initial release as the nearly four-hour film was cut down for distribution in the US, discarding half the material and turning a carefully thought-out composition with shifting timelines into a narrative devoid of logic. Consequently, the box office returns were meager and critics' taunts were harsh. This hit Leon hard, and Woods later regretted not calling him after this distribution disaster, not finding the right words as he was too young and inexperienced to know how to support the master. The third in a series of outstanding films for Woods in the 80s was Salvador. The film told the story of a gonzo journalist collecting material in Civil War-ridden Salvador. This was the first of two films Oliver Stone directed under contract with Hamdale Film Corporation, and also one of his last two chances to make a mark in Hollywood, since his two previous films Seizure and The Hand had flopped. Perhaps for this reason, Woods, by this time gaining traction in the film circles, was not exactly respectful with Stone and others. As the director said, during the shooting which took place in Mexico simulating Salvador, Woods once snapped and, frustrated with the tough and unsanitary working conditions, wandered into the Mexican desert, where the police called by the director found and brought him back to the set. James also relentlessly pushed his namesake James Belushi into the background and didn't give him any screen space. When Salvador was released, it had limited theater screenings and cable airings, but critics nonetheless noticed Woods for another expressive and contradictory character, and the Academy nominated him for an Oscar for Best Leading Actor. You love this woman, you will be willing to change. Okay, I still drink and take a few hits of a joint or something once in a while, all right? That's okay. In the same intense 80s for him, would starred in the crime film Cop, the detective drama bestseller, the melodramatic thriller Against All Odds, as well as the film True Believer and The Boost. Cop is notable because it's the first film adaptation of neo-noir master James Elroy. Unlike the novel, the film turned out to be more polished, without Elroy's typical brutal scenes of violence and sex. Woods not only played the lead role in this film, but also produced it, and later said he chose this project instead of starring in Stone's Wall Street. You know, it could have been a mistake. He commented on his choice. Bestseller turned out better than Cop, and can be called secondary classic. It's a film containing an original idea, to show a killer who asks a novelist to write a novel about him. This idea was later used in other films, however, they couldn't create characters as lifelike and interesting as those played by Woods and Brian Dennehy. As for the melodramatic thriller Against All Odds, although Woods isn't on screen for too long, the film is important because his character, a powerful scumbag in the 90s, becomes one of his typical images, and he will interpret it again and again in different ways. True Believer is notable because James grew long hair and shares screen time with young Robert Downey Jr. As for the boost, Woods starred in it along with Sean Young. The film, based on a melodramatic novel, tells the story of a young New York couple who get hooked on coke. Sharon Stone auditioned for the lead female role, but Woods and director Harold Becker preferred Young. Stone would later remind Woods of this, and he would soon have a major scandal with Young. By the end of the 80s, Woods, who had just turned 40, finally began to feel that his acting career had succeeded. Thanks to the development of cable television and video cassettes, films in which he starred that initially did not get a wide release, Videodrome and Salvador gained widespread recognition. 
Once Upon a Time in America came out in full on VHS, and in its nearly four-hour format, the film was rediscovered. It was now comprehensible and turned out to be a masterpiece. Even a small role in the anthology by Stephen King, Cat's Eye, where Woods played a committed smoker, brought him popularity and the love of viewers. However, at the same time, when James's status in cinema became cemented, the first, but far from the last incident, occurred in his private life that drew heightened public attention. In 1988, threatening messages began to be found at Wood's house, who by that time was living with horse riding coach Sarah Owen. They found pictures of mutilated animals, a doll with a broken neck. An anonymous caller called James and hinted that it was all the machinations of Sean Young, who harbored a grudge against him from the film The Boost. Woods hired a lawyer and sued the actress for $2 million. The case hit the front page of publications such as the popular People magazine and was accompanied by a typical 80s headline, Fatal Attraction. Soon, however, it turned out that James's conclusions were premature. Everything wasn't so obvious, and the bold and sharp actor had been too hasty. The thing is, in this time, Young had managed to hire a private detective, and it turned out that the scary gifts were being planted by his girlfriend Owen, an experienced scammer. Now, Young brought a lawsuit against James, who settled the matter without further ado, paying the actress more than $200,000 and adding his apologies. Meanwhile, Owen, who by that time had become the actor's legal wife, initiated a divorce process, intending to squeeze as much money as possible from Woods and telling the press wild, incredible stories in which the actor appeared in the most unattractive way. He drinks a lot, watches porn, offends women, and once threatened her with a gun. In the end, Owen didn't get any money, and Woods was so worn out that at any mention of what happened in an interview, he literally exploded. However, he was ready to move on, as James said in his characteristic, energetic expressions. I've scraped the shit off my shoe. By the early 90s, the films and roles that Woods was performing had changed. If in the 80s he usually played the lead in complex dramatic films, in the 90s he appeared in Hollywood mainly in supporting roles. For 17 years, Woods was with the major talent agency, Creative Artists Agency, CAA, but it wasn't a great fit. According to James, CAA sought to promote their clients in any commercial cinema often quite poor, as long as their charges became popular as soon as possible and they could collect hefty commission. Woods had long balanced the interest of CAA and his own, which drew him not so much to money as to quality material. But in the end, his patience was exhausted and he moved to International Creative Management ICM, known for greater freedom. Just a few days later, he received confirmation that his decision was correct. The new agency arranged a meeting for him with the rising star director, Quentin Tarantino, who, during the business conversation, revealed that he had several times sent the Reservoir Dog script to his representatives and offered a role specifically written for him. But CAA deemed the fee that Tarantino could pay so laughable that they didn't even bother to inform Woods about the offer. Man, I would have made that movie for free, the actor replied, crushed. Now, having moved to ICM, he instructed all scripts to be sent to him for personal review, and he sometimes pursued up to 15 per week. One of Wood's key Hollywood roles became his work in the comedic action movie The Hard Way. At the helm of the project were director John Badham and actor Michael J. Fox. The film's concept was somewhat similar to Best Seller. A Hollywood actor accompanies a police officer on calls and lives at his house to create a convincing screen image based on the experience. Fox was meant to play the actor, but the role of the police officer still had to be decided. As Fox said, discussing candidates with the director, they decided they need someone very expressive. And at that moment, they both said Wood's name. Fox also added that he wasn't afraid of Wood since he had previously spent five months in the jungles of Thailand with Sean Penn on the film Casualties of War. Jokes aside, James agreed to participate in the film, and contrary to expectations, he behaved sociably on set, stating, for example, that Michael J. Fox was the kind of guy you couldn't help but love. He also joked that being a cop on screen was better in real life because blanks were used instead of real bullets, and because you got paid more. Additionally, being primarily a dramatic actor, this was his first time participating in the staging of large-scale action scenes, and although stuntmen performed all of the difficult stunts, he still had to appear in close-ups, and once during filming a tow truck scene, he managed to fall and dislocate his shoulder. When the shooting was over and the hard way hit theaters, Americans met the film without particular enthusiasm according to James. 
A week before the premiere, the Gulf War had thundered, also known as the Television War because it had unprecedented media coverage and was literally broadcasted live. Woods believed that viewers were so impressed by the new show, they weren't interested in a comedic action film. However, over the years, like other Woods films, The Hard Way eventually received its due. The film gained almost cult status on video and television, and rightfully so. If you watch the film now, the on-screen duo of Woods and Fox is on par with similar pairs such as Nick Nolte and Eddie Murphy, Mel Gibson and Danny Glover. The interaction between the actors is excellent, and for Fox, this is one of his best roles, where you can see him in the prime of his boyish charm. As for vampires, another significant role for Woods in a Hollywood movie, the story about a team of vampire hunters went through several stages of development, and initially, Duff Lundgren could have played the lead role. When John Carpenter took the helm of the project, he decided to invite Woods for the main role, because, according to his logic, no one expects to see James in an action movie, and even more so in the image, albeit controversial, of a hero. The film took place in Mexico, and Carpenter gave in to Woods, allowing him to improvise and agreed that they would shoot two versions of the scenes, strictly according to the text and with his impromptus. According to Carpenter, James' ideas were so good that for the most part he left them in the movie. In addition, they were also indecent. Huh? You get a little mahogany from that little ebony? Come on, tell the truth. When Vampires was released, they did excellent box office in the opening weekend, but in the case of Carpenter, this was not necessarily a good sign. He was mostly an independent director, and many connoisseurs believed that vampires marked the beginning of his creative decline. For Woods, this role was more of an experiment, with which, however, he coped excellently once again. As for the supporting works of the 90s, in them, James mainly continued to develop the line outlined by him in the 80s. In the movie Against All Odds, his villains and antagonists from the movies The Getaway, Contract, The Specialist, and The General's Daughter look like variations of the same character. The Specialist is especially interesting where Woods met Sharon Stone again. Now Stone was already a world star, but despite her status, she was ready to listen to Woods and although she teased him for not taking her in the boost, she was ready to accept his creative suggestions. It is known, for example, that the actress refused to play a scene in the shower with Stallone until Sly drank a bottle of vodka with her. With Woods, she sparred in a different manner. So James suggested she quote a scene from the movie with Rod Steiger in The Heart of the Night, in which the characters exchange slaps. In Wood's interpretation, it was a whole series of blows and Sharon said, Go ahead, do it, don't bruise me! Going through this execution again and again for 10 takes. Said, <laughs> who are you? Hmm? <laughs> who are you? Huh? I'll tell you who you are. You are nobody. One of the takes ended up in the movie but some episodes with the actor remained on the cutting room floor. The fact is that at the test screenings, the audience found Wood's villains more interesting than Stallone's hero, and James's screen presence was drastically cut, while Stallone was added. For example, they shot an additional fight in the bus. The story hit the media and subsequently spread as another funny fact about Stallone, who doesn't want to share the audience's attention with anyone. However, you can look at it from a different perspective. As the director of The Specialist, Luis Losa, explained, the editing and reshooting were related to the fact that The Specialist is a Stallone movie and viewers come for his hero, not for the villain played by Woods. During this same period, James also performed a number of small but resonant dramatic roles in Nixon, Ghosts of Mississippi, and Casino. Since the time of Salvador, Woods had befriended Stone. Stone had invited him to Platoon, Wall Street, and then to JFK. Woods did not accept the offer for Platoon, as he had enough of jungles. He turned down Wall Street because he wanted to film Cop, and he declined JFK because his agent felt that James was too high profile for the small role being offered to him. However, for Nixon, Woods ignored everyone and agreed to play a small role. The film was about the 37th President of the United States, Richard Nixon, and in particular about the famous Watergate scandal, when it was discovered that Nixon's aides had wiretapped their Democratic Party opponents. James played Nixon's chief of staff, a man named Harry Roberts Haldeman. The final runtime of the film stretched to three hours, and although Woods spoke in interviews about how wonderful the picture was, the general audience received Nixon without much enthusiasm, and the film flopped at the box office. This, however, did not prevent Woods and Stone from working together again. Four years later, James appeared in the director's film Any Given Sunday. 
Ghosts of Mississippi also touched on politics and told the story of Brian Della Beckwith, a racist and Ku Klux Klan activist who killed a black civil rights activist, for which he was tried several times until on the third attempt, already a pensioner, he was finally sentenced to life. Initially, 70-year-old Paul Newman was considered for this role, but 50-year-old Woods fought his way through, pushed Newman aside, and persuaded director Rob Reiner to take him. Age was added to him with the help of makeup. As James said, preparing for the role, he noticed how naturally racists pronounced the N-word. He trained a lot and achieved the same ease. However, when the film was completed, the frequently repeated N-word scared the producers, and for the first television broadcast, they decided to replace it with Nibbler. But soon it became clear that Nibbler was more ridiculous than the politically incorrect N-word. So in the end, they returned to the first option, reassuring themselves that although the word is offensive, it's at least historically accurate. When Ghosts of Mississippi was released, the film attracted attention only because of Wood's performance. His impressive interpretation of Della Beckwith caused a fervor in the press and brought him his second Oscar nomination. This time, however, in the category of Best Supporting Actor. Although working with Stone and Reiner meant a lot to Woods, the main director he wanted to work with was Martin Scorsese. Remembering the annoying episode when he missed out on a role in Reservoir Dogs due to his acting agency, James now personally monitored what new projects the masters were preparing, and when he learned that Scorsese was filming Casino, he left him with the following message. A any part, anywhere, anytime, any price. An excited Scorsese called back and offered James a small but plot-forming role of a con man with whom Stone's character has been in love with since childhood. The job took two days. Upon arriving on set, however, Woods suggested expanding one of the scenes where he just talks on the phone and adding some powder and a prostitute. Initially, Scorsese said this was impossible, but then hired a girl from one of the Las Vegas establishments, so while the powder was fake, Woods, as he says, really used the girl's services. On set of Casino, James also crossed paths with Robert De Niro for the second time, and once again with Sharon Stone, with whom he had become friends by this time. The actress later said, Jimmy was one of the few Hollywood people I invited to my wedding. He's simply a wonderful man. In the late 90s, Woods also appeared in Sofia Coppola's film, The Virgin Suicides. Although the actor's hallmarks have always been expressive play, accompanied by bursts of rage and sarcasm, in this film, James showed a different side. He played in an introspective manner and appeared in an atypical image of a school teacher and family man. By the early 2000s, Woods, who had worked with Cronenberg, Leon, Stone, and Scorsese, began to become disillusioned with cinema. Although he no longer had to make great efforts to get a role in a film, and directors themselves sent him scripts, he was not satisfied with the material. As James amusingly expressed in a 2006 interview, Finally, I saw a good movie, The Departed. And look what it took. It took Marty Scorsese, Matt Damon, Mark Wahlberg, Leonardo DiCaprio, Jack Nicholson, screenwriter Bill Monaghan, and it's based on another movie. In light of such statements, it is understandable that his role in Scary Movie 2 was more of a joke. Although, this joke became a meme thanks to his improvisation. Fuck this. Fuck. Fuck. Did you see this? His roles in films like John Q, Be Cool, or later in White House Down, and the remake of Straw Dogs could add nothing more to his reputation. In 2006, like many actors looking for challenging dramatic material, he turned to television, and accepting an offer from the president of CBS and his longtime friend and poker partner Leslie Moonves, he signed up for the role of a lawyer in the series Shark. The script was written specifically for James and took into account his established image of a contradictory hero, as well as some contradictory facts from his personal life. For example, his interest in young girls, with whom he, a 60-year-old bachelor, was dating, raising fierce prejudice in the media. Shark lasted two seasons, relying entirely on Wood's charisma, but even during the shooting of the first season, James unexpectedly learned of the sudden death of his younger brother, with whom he had just traveled across the states of America. After the funeral, he felt really bad, but said to himself, I'm a man, I'm tough, I'll do it, he said, heading off to work. Nevertheless, due to a bout of hypertension that occurred on the set, he had to take sick leave and spend some time at home. When the show, which was extended for a second season and had some success, faced production difficulties and competition, James ended the contract. His interest in public life was growing. Back in 2001, as a first-class passenger on the Boston-Los Angeles flight, James noticed a group of four suspicious Arabs. They were tense, whispering about something and ignoring the stewardess. 
Woods, a lifelong actor accustomed to observing people, understood that something was wrong. He called the co-pilot and told him that these men apparently were planning to hijack the plane. A month later, when the terrorists hijacked the planes, including a liner on the Boston-Los Angeles flight, and crashed into the Twin Towers, James called the FBI, and the next day he was questioned by special agents. Although there was no official report on this incident, it is believed that Woods witnessed what is known as a practice run, in which the criminals rehearsed their plan of action. As Woods later said, he recognized two of the 19 identified hijackers. The other two, he was unofficially informed, also participated in the attack. In 2009, Woods set up a Twitter account and began openly writing about what bothered him in today's America. A former political science student and the person with the highest IQ among Hollywood stars, Woods, in his posts, responded to various manifestations of public life in the US, criticizing the aggressive agenda of social and gender inclusivity, attacking the policy of the Democratic Party. He did not appreciate the controversial film by Luca Guadagnino, Call Me By Your Name, which tells the story of a relationship between a 24-year-old graduate student and a 17-year-old youth and wrote that this picture breaks the last bounds of decency, immediately running into a relationary post from one of the actors of this film, Army Hammer, criticizing James for his young girlfriends. He criticized cases where parents involved little children in gender experiments. In response, Neil Patrick Harris attacked Woods, who only had enough intelligence to insult him ignorant de class A. James countered that children should not serve as puppets for promoting gender diversity. However, Woods began to make the most serious attacks against the policies of the Democratic Party and Democratic presidents. When, during a government shutdown, veterans were unable to enter the closed National Mall in Washington, but Obama allowed a migrant rally to be held there, Woods, a military son, couldn't stand it and wrote, Barack Obama's petty jihad against World War II heroes is simply the nadir of politics in America. He is just vile, a small, small man. When the son of the current president, Joe Biden, was involved in a scandal with a laptop and compromising materials, Woods circulated a cartoon about him that went viral. In the end, the actor's Twitter began to gain more and more influence and followers in conservative circles, where he was hailed as a hero. However, these laurels had their price. The actor's agency refused to represent James' interest in Hollywood. The actor's account and his posts were repeatedly blocked, and some of the bands, as it recently turned out, were sanctioned from above. After Elon Musk bought Twitter, his team discovered that the White House controlled the rotation of posts, limiting views and banning those containing criticism of the Democratic Party, the president, and his family. Upon learning of this, James said that he would initiate a public lawsuit against the Democratic Party Committee of the USA and accuse them of fraud, as well as of negatively affecting his acting career. The former star of the movie Nixon, Woods, wrote a post addressed to President Biden. How is the Twitter file chicanery any different from Watergate in some and substance? Nixon resigned when his henchmen tried to subvert free speech. Your turn, Mr. Biden. These intentions of Woods well illustrate his vibrant career and life path. Sharp on screen and bold in life, James once again showed himself as a man ready to prove his rightness before any authorities. As for his acting works, controversial and expressive characters of the 80s and 90s, they have long been recognized. If you liked the video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.